Hey everybody, it's the Board Game Blogger. Today I'm here to review Pax Porfiana. Now this is really a fantastic, fantastic game. Uh, it's almost entirely card based. Uh, you've got you know a few cubes and uh, chips for money. And it's set in sort of, uh, you know, revolutionary uh, Mexico. Uh, you're in it's sort of the era of uh, Porfiana Diaz. And what I really like about this game is there's alternate win conditions. Uh, people play as hacendados, and you're kind of amassing uh, money, uh, support, uh, politicians maybe. Uh, troops are actually sort of fighting for you and are loyal to you. And you're trying to uh, seize power in Mexico through one of four ways. Um, there's four different uh, sort of types of points that you can get. There's loyalty, uh, you know, if you're the, sort of seen as the true heir to Diaz and you're supporting him. So, you know, he basically resigns and then you take over. There's uh, outrage points with uh, American intervention. And you've been able to convince the Americans enough to support intervention into uh, Mexico. There's also revolution points. And, uh, and support points. And finally, there is a way to win um, in which Diaz is never toppled and Diaz remains in power, and then it's whoever has the most money. And I really like games like that. I love games with alternate win conditions. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the reasons I like successors so much. And this game, uh, you know, it plays out well that way. Uh, cards are wonderful. There's a lot of, uh, you know, great flavor text on most of these cards. Um, there's a lot of information on the cards. Cards are pretty good quality. Um, you know, they're not the best, but they're not the worst. That's, I'd put them kind of mid-range in the quality uh, for the cards. You've got uh, the rule book, and it's, it's pretty shoddy for trying to learn how to play this game. Um, you know, it's got kind of a nice glossary we can look up things so if you already know how to play and there's you know a terminology you're not sure of on a particular card uh, you can look it up now there's over 200 cards in the game and you're really only playing with 50 plus 10 per player uh, the game comes with components enough for five players uh, with um, there's enough cards for six but it's missing uh, sort of the cubes. So you'd have to supply yourself with cubes to fit in a six player. However, I really wouldn't recommend playing with five or six players. You know, even four is pushing it. Um, you know, there's no board, and uh, I think Callendale has mentioned this a lot, that he does not like this game because, you know, you can't really see what people have in their tableau. You know, they're building up these cards um, that are basically, you know, their natural resources, their land, their politicians, their army, and it's kind of tough to tell what someone has on their tableau. Um, and if you've got, you know, five or six players, that's definitely true. And you can't really keep track of whatever everyone has. I think this game excels at a two or three player. Um, it's a really good two player game, uh, excellent two player game. That's how I've mostly played this, in fact. Um, but it's, it's, I think, good with three. Four, I think, depending on how comfortable you are at like seeing everyone else. Is there you only really have to keep track of three other people. It's, it's good there. And it's more chaotic, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, some people don't like the chaos. If you want kind of less chaos, two players is good. But I, I enjoy it with three and four as well. I think five and six is pushing it just because you're not able to see and, oh, okay, this guy's got this card, which bends the rules in this way. And, you know, each kind of card maybe gives you some kind of unique ability um, that will break, you know, the normal rules, like most, you know, card games. Uh, but really good with two or three, uh, also good with four. I think five or six is pushing it. Uh, this is a game, though, where it's tough to tell how long you're going to play for. You know, you can end this game in, you know, 35 minutes, or you can play an hour and a half. Um, that's sort of because, uh, you know, victory is checked at certain times. 
So there's four topple cards in the deck on, you know, these are opportunities for, you know, to topple Diaz. You know, he's, you know, ill in the hospital with surgery or someone tried to assassinate him. And so it's at that point that uh, victory conditions are checked. And so, you know, when this first card comes out, someone could buy it, activate it, and win right away. Or, you know, that doesn't even happen on the fourth one, and then we go to a money victory. So, really a big variable in time, which, you know, I don't have a problem with, that a lot of people don't have a problem with. But sometimes you're saying, oh, I'm dedicating this much time to this game. You know, I want it to go this long. And that can be tough and difficult to do sometimes. Um, you know, if, if you just don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, as I was saying, the rule book is really tough. It's kind of tough to learn this game. I highly recommend getting um, this player aid. Um, Joe Berger uh, put it up on uh, Board Game Geek. Uh, I sang his praises hugely in uh, the Vulgari Eloquentia. He made a wonderful, wonderful player aid in that game. Uh, he's done it again for Pax Porfiana. Um, I mean, uh, companies need to hire him because he makes the absolute best player aids and uh, I wouldn't even consider playing this game without this player aid that's how good this is uh, it's, it's truly an excellent game um, it's just neat because the way you're building up your economy uh, even the way the economy works there's you know bull and bear markets and you know you can go into a massive depression where Suddenly, you know, these things that were making you money, like mines and banks, are now costing you money, and you have to sell off your properties, um, you know, or, you know, because you don't have enough money, and you're not generating enough money, and uh, it's neat that way, you know, I've won a victory that way, um, by basically stockpiling money, um, had kind of a more of a resource-proof economy than my opponents, and just sent it into a depression, um, and I really wasn't ready to win. I mean, I couldn't have won unless we'd gone into a depression. Uh, some people aren't going to like that. Some people like, you know, you're building up an economy and it's always growing. Uh, that's not very realistic t to life. Um, and I really like this game because of that. Because, you know, your economy can get destroyed, you know, and you're going to play on rest cards and other people, um, you know, have revolts on their minds, on their, uh, you know, nationalize their banks and they're going to lose the economy. It's really uh, an interesting game and you know, you're sending troops um, you know almost to extort other people's uh, industries. It's, it's really an interesting game and then you have you know different economies um, you know and uh, mines are worth different amounts, banks are worth different amounts and there's specialty um, sort of events that happen in different economies and there's also a depression in each economy uh, you know and when I say economy I mean sort of the regime in charge so you know you could have martial law or you could have anarchy and you've got different um, economic values from that but it, it's really neat when it goes into the depression it's not going to happen every game and some people they don't like that um, as I mentioned you know they want to just keep growing the economy but it's wonderful. It really works in this game. It's not going to happen every game. You know, every time I've played this game, it's been a different game each time, which is really nice. Um, it's really nice in that aspect. Um, but I'm sure you kind of want to see how this plays. Um, but highly recommend this game for two or three players. Um, so then you can kind of keep track of what's on everyone's tableau. Basically, when cards come out, you read it to everybody. You know, they can all inspect it um, and see, and then. It's not too much to keep track of, but uh, you know, five or six. It's just I can see why Callendale saying he doesn't like the game because at that many players, you just can't keep track of what they have. You know, whereas if it's on a board, it's kind of more represented that oh, here I've got this ranch here in Sonora, uh, or you know, this mine in uh, you know the southern United States but it's not as easy to see necessarily on the cards. Two or three player game, not an issue. Four, pushing it kind of depending on the players. But uh, one last thing, the box, uh, this is so totally minor, I would still completely recommend getting this game, but I don't like how this box is kind of, 
it's hinged like this um, instead of you know kind of a normal just putting on. I see this you know eventually breaking. Um, I wish they'd kind of done more traditional box with just kind of a, a stack on lid there. Obviously, I wish there were better rules, um, especially kind of a, a sample play would have been nice. Um, you know, just so you kind of get a flow for the game. Um, but I'll kind of play out a couple of turns here, set it up for a two-player, so people can see how it plays out. Um, but I love the cards, I love the artwork, the flavor text. Cards are pretty busy. Learning it initially can be kind of difficult. Um, but once you get that kind of rule set locked in, it's pretty nice. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the game now. Here's the game on setup. We have uh, sort of the main play deck here. Uh, we've got the economy, which regime we're in. We have the cards for purchase. We have here uh, a player and his, his cards, his cubes, and, and his money down here. Uh, same with the white player. Now there are six potential uh, Hacendados, sort of the player you are. And they'll have sort of unique abilities. Here, if we uh, zoom in here on Carenza, his special ability is you can buy black cards from the market for zero gold. And he can be flipped over uh, for a loyalty point or a revolution point. It's only one or the other. However, he's going to lose his ability. So right now he's earning two uh, sort of dollars a turn. If we flipped him over, we could, you know, flip him over, for instance, and he'd be worth a revolution point, uh, you know, for winning potential revolution victory. However, um, you know, if someone's going for, say, a command victory, it's not going to be as helpful. Again, the, the four types are revolution, outrage, loyalty, and command. Uh, command sort of simulating you've got the military on your side uh, for that type of a backing. So if he's flipped over, he loses his special ability, which is you know buying black cards from the market for zero gold, and also his income generation of two a turn. So you don't necessarily want to do that um, unless it's going to guarantee you victory, or if you're flipping to prevent somebody else from getting a victory. So it's. Uh, uh, Karenza's turn to start. He starts with four gold. Uh, the next player will start with five. The next player will start with six and so on if you're playing with more players. And you now have three actions to perform. Uh, one action is buying a card from the market. Now the cards start at zero cost for these ones. These are one, two, four, eight, and sixteen. So it can get kind of pricey. Buying one card costs one action, unless, however, you want to buy two cards, because the second card you buy on the same turn would be another two actions, and that would be your full three actions. You can choose to play a card from your hand, because, for instance, when you purchase a card, let's say, Karenza here, he's purchasing this card, it costs zero because it's there. Um, that was one action, he's going to play it, the cost here is four. It's going to cost him $4 uh, to play it. It's in the upper right. Info here in the bottom left is it's in Sonora. Because um, it can... There's three sort of locations that cards could be. You know, one is Sonora. Uh, the other is uh, Chihuahua. And the other one is uh, sort of America. Here, this is the connection. So the way you get to it is, uh, you know, via donkey. Uh, or horse. Here you can upgrade the connection, uh, build a railroad out to it, it's going to cost four, and the start income is going to be one cube. So he's going to play that down, put his uh, four dollars into the bank, and he'll place a cube here. So he's now earning three a turn. That was two actions, one to purchase the card, a second one to play the card. Now, there's a couple other actions you can do. If, for instance, he didn't want to play it, but he could sell it to the bank. Um, the sale price is whatever the economy is. 
So here, I'm starting the default in Pax Porfiana. The economy, the value is three. So he's gonna get $3 for just selling a card from his hand. It's gonna change, of course, depending on the economy. You can uh, buy land, and that is, you know, expand the ranch you're in. It's gonna cost two actions, and uh, you can then pay based on how many cubes are already on the ranch, and then expand it. So right now it would just cost one, because there's only one cube on it. He could spend two actions, pay it, and expand the ranch, and then that ranch generates two. Again, that's a two action thing. You could upgrade a connection for an action. Uh, you can purchase these public cards. Uh, there's two public cards, the Catholic Church and Teddy Roosevelt. They're both very expensive cards, as we see. Uh, Ro Roosevelt's 18 and the Catholic Church is 16. However, you buy it and play it in one action. So it's not, you know, one action to purchase, one action to play. Um, those can be helpful in getting your points. So for instance, Teddy Roosevelt here, he can uh, be an average point and change it to U.S. intervention. Because let's say, for instance, you're trying to win an outrage victory. The regime, in fact, when the topple card is executed, has to be the U.S. intervention. Uh, because on a topple, we have here, uh, the U.S. will annex part of Mexico, and the outrage victory is you win if your outrage is more than the uh, tripartite outrage. And that means what happens in, for instance, in a uh, multiplayer game, uh, Diaz sort of has two default in each victory condition. He has two outrage, two command, two revolution, and two loyalty. And you must amass more than Diaz and your next two uh, lowest rivals. In a two-player game, obviously it's just Diaz plus your rival, but Diaz has a default of three in a two-player game. Uh, another action is you can speculate. You can place a cube and put it down here, for instance, on the bank. And it's speculating. And now when someone chooses to purchase this card from the market, instead of paying the bank, they're going to pay the money to you. Uh, just an additional uh, powerful action uh, to get some money and kind of almost blocking an opponent sometimes from getting a very powerful card. So for instance, this bank can be quite powerful. It costs nine to play, but we can see here it's worth a loyalty point. So for obtaining loyalty victory, that can be quite powerful. Again, multiplayer game, Diaz only has two. So if you have three and your opponents have none, you get the uh, regime into Pax Porfiana and then trigger a topple and you can win. Additionally, there's some topple cards uh, one, there's four top of cards in the entire deck. One of each is going to reduce Diaz's, uh, you know, strength in any particular victory condition by one. You know, so there's one that reduces his command by one, one that reduces his revolution by one, for instance. So when that top of card comes out, you can still topple through another way. So if it's, if it reduces his revolution by one, you can still win a loyalty victory, but it will enable someone to try the other type a little bit easier. So additionally on this bank, we can see we can purchase enterprises from the market for zero gold. That's very powerful because right now this card in this slot here, you know, it costs eight to purchase that card. Um, and it's going to earn uh, a value of three here in this economy. So it's a pretty powerful card. Um, so speculating on there can be good. So now, what would happen, uh, we've played the three actions, we're going to discard any headlines, these are the headline cards. If they get all the way down to the zero and no one's purchased them, they uh, are simply discarded. However, their value, if they're a bull or if they're a bear, is still important and that will still show. If two bears happen in a row, uh, the economy is sent into a depression, and that's when each card you have in play, you have to pay, uh, you know, a dollar for. So it can be very expensive. Here, you know, you're still going to uh, be okay, 
because you know this ranch is going to pay for itself but you know for instance in depression mines and banks uh, are worth zero so it's going to cost you money having those cards and any additional cards you have such as troops uh, partners those types of things can be expensive uh, we're going to then restore the market so these cards will all slide down and we're going to deal out a new card here so things kind of get cheaper progressively uh, as the game progresses and we'll now collect income uh, we have three cubes here so Carenza will earn three dollars and now we'll go over here uh, with Madero he can buy partners from the market for half that's his special ability it's going to start with five here so we'll kind of see if there's any partners uh, available so for instance this Apache Scouts uh, it's worth an outrage point so if you're going for an outrage victory that can be good lets you redeploy troops for zero cost so that's uh, a good ability so what uh, Madero is going to do, he's going to get both these cards here for free. Um, this ranch here, it's in America, it's a little more expensive. It's going to cost 10 to build, as opposed to this cheaper Sonoran one. But its ability is a land grant, and you can expand the land, you know, buy more land, expand its ranch uh, for just one action instead of two. So it can be kind of powerful uh, there. So he's going to have these, they go into his hand, so we'll just put them here, because they're in his hand. Um, these cards will all slide down, and we'll deal a couple of new cards. And it's back to uh, Carenza. And that's sort of, you know, how the game plays. You're going to sort of progress in that manner. Um, if people comment and they kind of want to see a full playthrough, I will do a full playthrough later. Um, you know, but that can, I don't know if people really want to watch an hour long video or not. So that's uh, an ability uh, I may do later. But that's kind of just basic how it plays the different actions. It's really interesting because then, you know, just you have so much player interaction, you can, you know, attack people. So for instance, if Madero, he he owns this and then he plays it. It's going to cost him zero. He'll play it onto uh, Carenza's thing. It's going to give Carenza, in fact, an outrage point because, um, you know, it's, these banditos have stolen from him. He would steal three dollars from him and we'd go to Madero's pocket and we'd then place two unrest. Until these unrest are cleared through a pleas action, this is earning him uh, no income, and he couldn't use any special ability on it. But then this outrage point would slip under him, because you know there's justifiable outrage in America for intervention, because you know Mexico is just out of control. Uh, police action to remove is you just, you would pay three gold uh, and spend an action to remove one unrest disc. If, however, we're in martial law, it's not going to cost any money. You can just remove it. Um, still costs an action though. Uh, I think I've gone through all the different actions. Um, you know, there's partners that are going to affect and break the rules. It's really interesting. Um, and another thing is because you're not using all the cards, there's over 200 cards in the game, you can't really be count card counting and planning for, okay, this card's going to come out, I haven't seen it yet. You know, in a game like Twilight Struggle, for instance, you know, oh, I'm not going to put any support into um, you know, Egypt until the Suez crisis is triggered, for instance. You could make that kind of plan, um, and that's kind of a gamey situation. That can't happen here because you just don't know what cards are going to be in here. You know, especially if you're playing just, uh, you know, three, four players, you're playing with less than half the deck in the game. So <clears throat> you just can't depend on any one card being there or not being there. Um, it's an excellent, excellent game. Highly recommend it if uh, you can find a copy. I think they're planning to come out with uh, this kind of system uh, in the Renaissance uh, with a few changes. I'm really looking forward to it. This is a, a very accessible Sierra Madre game. Um, bad rule book. I'd highly recommend uh, picking up this.
player aid that's on the Geek by Joe Berger. Um, highly recommend this game. Till next time on the Board Game.